Park Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Jane Wyman. Tonight's story, The Dark Heart. And now to our story as narrated by Viney Burroughs, who plays Elizabeth Keckley. So much has been written about this woman. So much said against her that I feel I must speak. During those incredible, dangerous years, when her every word became a scandalous headline, I believe I knew her better than most. As her dressmaker, who was privileged to become her friend, I was present during the most dramatic moments of her life, moments that became American history. What I'm about to relate is the story of Mary Todd, wife of Abraham Lincoln. Not as the newspapers wrote of her, but as I knew her. It was in 1861, shortly after the inauguration. I remember it so well. That day, Ms. Lincoln told me about her plans. Happiness had made her radiantly beautiful. Her eyes sparkled as she stood in front of the large mirror admiring the dress I had just sold for her. Oh, Elizabeth, the parties I shall have, the receptions. We shall have excitement and gaiety such as Washington has never known. Uh, yes, Ms. Lincoln, when the war is won... Not when the war is won. Now. But, Miss Lincoln, the war... Is dreadful. I know. But that's all the more reason why I should give parties. All America, the whole world, will see that the president is unafraid. Yes, ma'am. And I shall be at his side, Elizabeth. I shall always be at his side. Yes, Miss Lincoln. How the Washington women must envy me. The first lady of the land. <laughs> you wait, Elizabeth. You wait and see... They will sue for my favor. Well, I've done a great deal of sewing for the ladies of Washington. They wouldn't be intentionally unkind, but, but you're a stranger to them. I'm the wife of their president. Yes, but I'm afraid. Oh, Elizabeth, there's nothing to be afraid of. Everything will be done my way, and it will be wonderful. Because I will have it so. <laughs> But it was not to be. During the days that followed the inauguration, Ms. Lincoln was the only topic of conversation. No matter where I went, for whom I sold, it always seemed as though the subject of Mary Lincoln always came up. The only point I'm trying to make about her, Lavinia, is that she... Elizabeth, don't you think that skirt should be lifted just a little? It could, Miss Evans, just a bit here at the waist. There. How's that? Oh, that's fine, Elizabeth, that's fine. Go on, Margaret. Well, Mrs. Lincoln was, after all, born and bred in the frontier of Kentucky. Oh, Elizabeth, you've raised it too high. Excuse me. I'll let it down. Alice Lambert says that she is crude, even vulgar. Now, you can't ignore that, Lavinia. Oh, nonsense. It just so happens that Mary Lincoln was gently reared and is at all times a lady. Oh, Lavinia. Now, Alice Lambert is a Southern sympathizer. It is, and Mary Lincoln's family is fighting for the South. Her own? Brother. Well, it's hardly her fault. Oh, you're just being stubborn, Lavinia. Anyway, I find her arrogant and willful. In what way? Well, in the midst of a great and terrible war, Mrs. Lincoln plans to give a ball. Well, I'd say that was ill-advised. But not scandalous. Not scandalous? Well, the whole of Washington is shocked. With our soldiers defeated in almost every battle, with the city of Washington itself in daily peril, what does Mrs. Lincoln do? She decides to give a party. And you're not going? Not going, Lavinia? Are you mad? I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> Elizabeth, I don't care what people say. It's going to be the greatest and most beautiful ball that's ever been given. And, Elizabeth... The gown you've made for me, it's so beautiful. Thank you, Miss Lincoln. It's easy to work well when I'm working for you. You have such good taste. Will, will the president like it, do you think? I hope so. Oh, I've looked forward to this so long, and I'm so happy. May I come in? It's the president. 
I don't want him to see my gown until the ball. Help me out of it, Elizabeth, quickly. Yes, Mr. Lincoln. Yes, that's better. Mother, are you there? A moment, Mr. Lincoln. My morning robe, please. And will you hand the other one in the closet? Shall I open the door for Mr. Lincoln? Oh, no, no, no. Just put away the gown. I'll open it. Come in, Mr. Lincoln. You thought to see my gown for the ball tomorrow night, didn't you? Gown? Oh, your gown for the ball. Yes, it's very pretty, Mother. <laughs> no, this is my morning coat. Oh, well, it's still very pretty. Good afternoon, Elizabeth. Mr. Lincoln. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mother, but Willie wanted... He was right here. Willie? Here I am. Mother, make Father let me ride the pony. But I thought you were riding the pony. He made me stop. Then he must have had a good reason. He said I look sick, and I'm not sick. Sick? Come here, Willie. Let me feel your forehead. Mm. Now, don't squirm, dear. Oh, he's burning with fever. I am? Oh, no, 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 of course not, dear. Mother was exaggerating, but but I do want you to go to bed right away. I'd be glad to put him to bed, Miss Lincoln. Thank you, Elizabeth, but I, I think he wants his mother. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Really? He wants his father. Oh, oh, I, I see. Why, of course, dear... Mr. Lincoln? I'll take him. Willie, you go on ahead, dear. I want to speak to your father a minute. I want to race, Father. Well, some other time. Run along. Oh, all right. But hurry, Father. Mr. Lincoln, he does have a fever. He seems to feel well enough. And he was shivering. I'd better call Dr. Stone. Doctor? He's a sick little boy, Mrs. Lincoln. How sick? Mm, it's too soon to tell yet. Miss Lincoln. But I should say there's nothing to be alarmed about for the time being. Excuse me, Miss Lincoln, but the musicians would like to speak to you. They need your approval of the list of selections for the ball. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, the ball. Tell them to go away, Elizabeth. I'm canceling it. Uh, don't you think it best, Doctor? Well, his room is far from the East Room, so the noise won't disturb him. And as I said before, there's no cause for alarm at this time. Besides, all your invitations have been sent out. Oh, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't want to have a ball at a time like this. I'll stay with Willie every minute of the time, Miss Lincoln. I'll watch over him like he was my own. I know, Elizabeth. Then you won't cancel the ball? Well, we'll see. We'll see how he is tomorrow. <laughs> The next day, the little boy was better, much better. And that night, the night of the ball, was the happiest of Mrs. Lincoln's life. I helped to dress her hair, arrange her gown. She wore a low-cut white satin evening gown, flounced with black lace and with a long train. Her only ornaments were pearls. She looked beautiful. Why, even Mr. Lincoln said... You look charming, Mother. Do you really like it? Very much. But, my, what a long tail our cat has tonight. You mean my train? It's the latest style. Mother, it is my opinion. If some of that train was nearer the head, it would be in better style. Oh, have I offended you? Oh, no. I, I think nothing could offend me tonight. Willie is better. And all your fears? Were groundless. Your arm, Mr. President. <laughs> a pleasure, Madam President. Ms. Lincoln's party had been severely attacked, but all the important people came to it. The ladies looked lovely in satins and silks, but none looked lovelier than she. She outshone them all as she received her guests standing by the president's side. Look, Lavinia, everyone's here. Would you look at Mrs. Lincoln? She looks radiant. Her gown is beautiful. I wonder how much it costs. Oh, and do look at her pearls. Do you think they're real? Oh, Margaret, really? <laughs> Come, we'd better go in. Mrs. Roger Evans, Miss Lavinia Cummings. Well, I suppose we'll have to be received. 
I wonder how she'll patronize it this time. Margaret, hush. Are you afraid she'll hear me? That she'll know I'm as amused by her arrogance as by her extravagant taste in clothes? Good evening, Mrs. Evans. Why, Mrs. Lincoln, how beautiful you look. Well, thank you. Good evening, Miss Cummings. Mrs. Lincoln? I'm very glad both you could come. We wouldn't have missed it, would we, Lavinia? Such a lovely party. So distinguished. Lovely. Miss Lincoln. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Lisbeth. Miss Lincoln, may I speak to you a moment? Yes, what is it? It's Willie Mayhem. Willie? His fever's grown worse. He's calling for you. Calling for me? Well, yes, yes, of course. I I'll go to him at once. Mrs. Evans, Miss Lavinia, you must excuse me, but my son... My, my son... We understand. By all means, go to him, Mrs. Lincoln. You see, he's ill. Uh, are you coming, Elizabeth? Oh, please, hurry. <laughs> From that moment on, the ball was forgotten. Everything was forgotten except her son. Willie was seriously ill now. His poor little body, burning with fever, found no rest except in her arms. She held him. For hours at a time, she held him and counted every breath. And then came the moment. Are you all right, son? Keep fighting, Willie. Mother. Yes, my darling. Will it be long? Will, will what be long, dear? Before I can stop fighting? Oh, no. Willie. Willie. He wants to rest, Mother. I want to sleep. Then, then sleep, Willie. I'll hold you close, safe, safe in my arms where nothing can hurt you ever again. Rest, my son, and sleep. He's gone, Mother. <laughs> mother. Let me hold him. Let me hold him. A little longer. on the cavalcade of America. Jane Wyman is starring as Mary Lincoln. And now our story continues as narrated by Elizabeth Keckley, Mary Lincoln's seamstress. After Willie died, there were no more receptions at the White House, no parties. Ms. Lincoln received no callers. Day by day, we watched her retreat further and further into a world of sorrow. The president became more and more concerned. Mother. Yes? Walk to the window with me. There's something I want to show you. There is nothing I wish to see. Come, I'll help you. Take my arm. That's it. Now, Mother... Do you see that large white building on that hill yonder? I see it. Why? It is an asylum, Mother. Yes, I know. You must try to control your grief, or I'm afraid. That's a cruel thing to say. Is it cruel to want you to live for the sake of your living sons who need you? For my sake. I'll try. From then on, she did try. In an effort to become a part of what was happening, Mary Lincoln now turned her attention to her husband, not only at home, but in his official life as well. I'm afraid she didn't make things easy for him. Oh, he's a humbug, an obstinate fool, and a butcher. General Grant, 
But you say the same of General McClellan. If I listen to you, Mother, I should soon be without a general. Well, you must listen to me. General Grant is not fit to head an army. He's been very successful in the field. Yes, but at what cost? He loses two men to the enemy's one. He may depopulate the North. You exaggerate. You don't know the fact. Nevertheless, General Grant... He's winning. Oh, you won't listen to me. You never listen. You, you never, never listen to me. To her grief for her dead son was now added the feeling that her husband didn't want her help. And once more, she was quite alone. In this mood of despair and this black melancholy, Mary Lincoln found no relief. She performed her official duties unsmilingly. She was never heard to laugh until... Oh, my Mr. Wyckoff, <laughs> you're quite disreputable. It's the secret of my success, Mrs. Lincoln. <laughs> Henry Wyckoff, clever, polished, a man of the world, had been Ms. Lincoln's friend. He now became her advisor. The sparkle returned to her eyes, lasted to her lips. Ms. Lincoln became herself again. Now the help I require, Mr. Wyckoff, will take all the imagination and talent you possess. I am at your service, madame. I was thinking that it was time again that Mr. Lincoln and I gave a ball. Good, good. Not just an ordinary ball, but the largest and most beautiful Washington has ever seen. With flowers and music and wine. And... and so it began once more. Glittering parties, teas, music was heard in the East Room. And always Henry Wyckoff was among the guests. Paying Miss Lincoln extravagant compliments, laughing at her witticisms, taking note of the other guests, listening, observing. And then one day, the blow fell. It can't be true. It's on all the papers, Miss Lincoln. I can't believe it. I won't believe it. They arrested Mr. Wyckoff this morning. He's to be brought to the bar of the house, charged with contempt. But why? The charge is that he took a copy of the president's message to Congress and caused it to be printed in the paper before the speech was made. Mr. Wyckoff stole the message? Some say he did. Uh, others say... Uh, say what, Elizabeth? Well, people always talk, Miss Lincoln. You can't stop them, and they say that... Well? That the message was given to him. Elizabeth! Oh, Miss Lincoln, I know you didn't. Everybody must know I didn't. Oh, I wish that trial were tomorrow. I wish that trial were tomorrow. Order! Order! Mr. Wyckoff, you'll answer the question. Was the person who gave you this information a resident of the White House? I can only tell you, sir, that I received my information under an obligation of strict secrecy. Now everyone was certain Mary Lincoln was the guilty one. The talk grew louder and louder. The gossip became slander. Some people even called her a spy. But I'm not a spy. Then why don't you fight? I don't know how anymore. If Mr. Lincoln were to speak, it would be so simple. Oh, not a word to Mr. Lincoln, Elizabeth. Not one word. He has enough worry to worry him. And, and besides, I don't know how he feels about this. I don't know what anyone believes anymore. <laughs> The days went by, and still the president said nothing. Ms. Lincoln carried the burden alone. And yet we both knew that he must have heard the vile accusations, even threats directed against Ms. Lincoln. The bitter animosity against her was everywhere, in the newspapers, in the streets, in the very air of Washington. Would Mr. Lincoln ever speak out? The attacks came to a head when one day an unheard of thing happened. In one of the committee rooms, a secret meeting was called. Are we all here? Yes, I believe yes, we are. So. Well, then I suppose we should begin. I don't know how to do this. 
Well, why don't you conduct it as though it were an official meeting? I don't know. I suppose... Uh, gentlemen, as members of the Senate Committee on the Conduct of the War, we have met to consider a case of possible treason. It is unnecessary to remind you that... Uh, who is that? Whoever you are, sir, you're interrupting... President Lincoln. Mr. President. Gentlemen, it has been brought to my attention that you have called a meeting on a subject that is very close to me. I want to give you my solemn word that no member of my family is engaged in any treasonable activity whatsoever. Mr. <laughs> President, none of us actually thought that Mrs. Lincoln... Uh, uh, why, why, well, we would not have had this happen with you, it's sir. It's all right. It's yes. all right. But, Mr. President... I apologize for interrupting you. Please go on with your meeting. Well, gentlemen, there is no longer a reason for this meeting. I suggest we adjourn. <laughs> of the world, Mary Lincoln was now vindicated. The president's action meant even more than the later discovery that it was the White House gardener who'd given out the president's speech. But to Mary, the fact that her husband had defended her meant more than anything else. Mr. Lincoln, you stood by me before the world. Did you think I wouldn't? You can't know what these months have been like. I thought that... What did you think, Mother? That you didn't care. Or that you believed what they were saying. I only learned of it last night. Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't. Pride, Mary. Yes, pride. It's caused trouble all my life. And no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to help it. I've lost so much because of my pride. But it doesn't matter. Because I haven't lost you. With you beside me. Close to me. I'm so happy. So, so very happy. One of the most controversial figures in American history, accused of so much, arrogance, extravagance, heartlessness, so many felt justified in hating her. But when you judge her, if you do, remember with me those who loved her, the dying little boy who found peace in her arms, the kind, tired man in whose hands rested her entire happiness. And I loved her, too. That is the story of Mary Todd, wife of Abraham Lincoln, as I knew her. Thanks to Jane Wyman and the Cavalcade Players for tonight's story, The Dark Heart. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by Edith Sommer and Robert Soderberg, was suggested by Reveille in Washington by Margaret Leach, published by Harper and Brothers. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Borey. 
The program was directed by John Zoller. With our star, Jane Wyman, Viney Burroughs was Elizabeth Keckley, and Carl Weber was Lincoln. Others in our cavalcade cast were George Petrie, Dick Wigington, Joseph Bell, Ann Tobin, Ginger Jones, Haskell Coffin, and Daniel Arco. Jane Wyman will soon be seen in the new Warner Brothers Technicolor motion picture, the story of Will Rogers, in which he is co-starred with Will Rogers, Jr. This is Cy Harris. This is Bill Hamilton speaking for our cavalcade players, our writers and musicians, and wishing all of you a pleasant summer from the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Thank <laughs> you.